Hey, it's Tommy Hodgins, and today I'd love to share why it's so important to parse CSS accurately, especially if you're going to be working with it or building tools that work with CSS. Now, the reason why is because CSS as a language has certain constructs, certain, um, they're called productions and tokens, and to parse CSS accurately, you're able to use these tokens and work with these tokens. But unfortunately, a lot of existing CSS tooling out there and a lot of CSS workflows rely on parsing CSS inaccurately or in an imprecise way. Now, I believe that overall, this lack of accuracy is you're able to get so far, but once you hit a certain point, uh, it becomes apparent and the tool kind of breaks down and in order to take the next step or to move beyond the current state of the art, uh, you actually require a more accurate tool and one that is able to work more precisely with the actual matter that you're working on. So I have CSS tree and a live demo of post CSS and also a live demo of a CSS library that parses CSS according to the standard spec. Now, the reason why this is important is that CSS has been specified in a spec, and here they teach you how to parse CSS. They teach you how to handle errors correctly, because that's part of CSS as well. And it teaches you the different tokens that you can parse CSS into, and what's valid and what is part of what token. Um, so this is the diagram for what a number is. And then down below, most of the spec is spent just literally expressing the algorithm for how to parse this in English language. So to consume a comment, you start with a stream of code points, which is defined somewhere else. Um, and then it talks about if the next two are this, do that, you know, otherwise do this. And so you can see how easily this could translate into a programming language. So that's actually what happened. Um, as this was being written, Tab Atkins, one of the editors, wrote Parse CSS, a standards-based CSS parser, and this is based on the spec, and they're both written simultaneously. So as I understand it, uh, as Tab was writing this document, uh, they were testing the things that they were writing with this tool, and as they're developing this tool, they're obviously looking through and reading and implementing exactly what's in this spec. And so the result of this, while it's not new, it is very precise and very accurate. And so you can rely on this. Now it's written in ES5, a slightly older feature set of JavaScript, but it'll be widely supported everywhere. So this is something you can take, you can build on, this works. What I've done is I have taken that same library and I forked it um, so I could make it available as an ES module. I expressed the same code, the same logic in a newer feature set of JavaScript called ES6. And I've also, anywhere that I found a reference in the spec for what that code was doing, I put a little annotation there. So like consuming a string token here. If we copy that and hop over to the spec, we can cross-reference and say, um, this is how in CSS you consume a string token from a stream of code points. And you're either going to give a string token or a bad string token. So here are the instructions. And if you look here, um, these instructions are basically just the JavaScript interpretation of that. And the next thing down in the spec is how to consume a URL token. And the next thing below that in parse CSS is the same thing. It's how to consume a URL token. And so as you go through, you can kind of read and understand both documents and see the same things expressed in English and JavaScript. So that's what Parse CSS is. Now, the other thing you'll notice about Parse CSS is that it's big. There's a lot of code here. And the reason why is because the spec is also big. This doesn't concern itself with which properties are supported or valid or known properties. It doesn't concern itself with what different at rules are in CSS. This is just how to parse CSS syntax. The other um, 
modules define features that use CSS syntax, and they describe different grammar productions made up out of these tokens and out of these productions, and say like, you know, to support width, we'll have a property, and, and the name is gonna be width, and that's an ident token that has W, I, D, T, H, etc. But there will be no feature added to CSS or nothing that we'll need to support in the future that won't abide by CSS's specified syntax. So if we parse this, this is enough to parse all CSS forever. Um, we don't have to worry about lists of property names. We don't have to worry about lists of known valid selectors or anything. As long as it is 100% valid CSS syntax, we can parse it and reason about it. So some examples of why you might want to do that. Now first, I'm going to go through these and just show that they're working. And for a subset of valid CSS, they do parse things in a way that's helpful. So I'm going to write a rule for the selector A. I'm going to say width 5 px. That's a pretty basic thing, just one style rule with a declaration list with one declaration of a property named width and a value of 5 px. So if we look through here, the AST that CSS tree was able to parse out of this is a style sheet that has one rule, which has a selector list containing one selector of A. And then we also have a declaration list with one declaration for the property named width. And the value is a dimension token with a value of five in a unit of PX because CSS supports something called a dimension, which is a number that can be paired with a unit. So if we look in the syntax spec, um, where would this be? Dimension token. So here's the railroad diagram. It is a number token that is beside an ident token. So 5px, that's an example. And when we have a dimension token, we can work with that as a dimension token. So I'm gonna bring this over to post CSS and see what we end up with. Here we've got a style sheet with one rule. The selector is A. Inside we have a declaration list with one declaration with a property name width and the value 5px. So here we just have a value to work with. It didn't, it doesn't know if, if this was a 10px 5px, it doesn't know that those are two separate things. So we still have more work to do if we we're going to support something um, like a custom unit. I'll bring the example with two values back over to CSS tree. So you can see that there are two dimension tokens separated by some white space, but 10px and 5px. So this is accurate so far. If we bring this over to the browser, um, it doesn't know, it doesn't support width with two values, but if we did demo, we can see that it's able to parse and restringify these. So let's just call this demo. So now inside demo, we've got the same problem happening. It no longer parses or knows what those tokens are. They have to be valid CSS or you can't use it in CSS. And we've already shown that you can use this in CSS. So what's going on here? Why can't we see that there's two different dimensions and that those dimensions are PX units? Or what if we want to invent a different unit? So over here, this parses CSS using my version of tabs parse CSS. So it should function the exact same. And here, if I go to parse a style sheet, you'll notice that there is a qualified rule for the A selector but inside there is just this block here um, and everything is a token. It's just a stream of tokens. It doesn't know that this is a declaration list. It doesn't know what's a property name. It doesn't know what's a value. It just knows that all of these are valid CSS tokens. And so from here to here, we have things we can reason with. And look at what we ended up with. We have a dimension token with a value of 10 and a unit of PX. We have another dimension token with a value of five and a unit of PX. Now, if we wanted to take this and say, parse this as a declaration list, we can do that. 
and we'll see that we get back a list with one declaration. And in the declaration, we've got the name as demo. And we've got the value here is a token list. And we can do the same thing with parse a declaration. This is just going to give us one declaration. And further, we can continue and say, parse the value as a list of component values. So at every single level of this syntax, um, we're able to take JavaScript and parse it. Um, so list of component values. So this is just one component value is a dimension token, 10 px. Now, if I was going to do something like make a custom unit, let's say we have 10 ew. Now we support custom ew units and eh units and some others uh, at work as a percentage of an element's dimensions. So ew is one percent of an element's rendered width on the page. So 10 ew is 10 uh, element width units, as we like to think about it. Now, you'll notice down here, even if I get rid of this second value, um, even if I turn it back into a property that it thinks it understands, what I end up with parsed here is I've got a number 10, I've got an operator minus, I've got an identifier dash EW. So I've got three separate parts that if I was going to try to parse out this, I'm going to have to reassemble things from my AST that are adjacent to each other and shouldn't have been split up. Um, if I take this example over to post CSS, I've just got that 10 EW that's not particularly helpful. And um, if I bring that over to CSS, I've got a dimension token of 10 EW units. So even though that's not a supported CSS feature, if I bring this over to the browser, Chrome doesn't know about it, so it drops the whole declaration. It's valid CSS syntax, as we can see. And when you parse CSS as CSS, it actually knows that that is a dimension with a custom unit. So for us to support something like um, demo 10 EW 5px, we've got everything in the parsed AST to reason about this. The 5px shows up in a very similar way to the 10ew. Um, every single thing, even the white space, everything is accounted for, and we have the ability to enter different parser entry points. We can parse a style sheet, we can parse just a list of rules, just a single rule. Um, so we can work with these tokens at any level. We can turn them back into strings. We can parse them from strings. The whole thing is wide open. But one thing that this is not doing is it's not, if we have something like um, custom, and then inside that there's custom again, it doesn't know that this is a rule where here, something that these ones are doing is it's saying that there's a rule that's custom and it's trying to say inside, is it a declaration list? No, it's a rule. I discovered that this is a different production that I know about and it's trying really hard to create a style sheet of productions that it that all fit together that it knows. Um, but sometimes it's not able to do that. So here's an example. Um, this might be something that you would want to do. If you ask, what would I do with a custom unit? I use it for client side runtime things that are supplied by JavaScript, but you could use custom CSS units just in a static CSS style sheet that you wanted to pre-process. So imagine this, let's say you wanted to invent units like finger widths or one smidge, and you didn't want to use this because you know, if you put this in the browser, you know that it's not going to be read. So as of right now, it's not like you can register what this unit is with the browser and it will keep this and then you can support a client side, maybe someday, but we're not there yet. So if you wanted to support something like this today yourself, this might not be the way to do it. Having your uh, number operator and identifier and uh, same here, this it's giving you a value, but you still have work to do. If you were to take something 
and put it into parse it as CSS in a valid way, strictly valid, um, you've got things that you can work with. You've got 10 finger width dimension token here, and you've got a 40 finger width dimension token, and you've got one smidge. So what this lets you do is if you were to define what a finger width is somewhere else, maybe somewhere off in JavaScript or perhaps as part of your build command or something else, or even right here in the style sheet. So here I've created, I've invented my own custom units at rule. And all that this is going to do is specify if we said dash dash finger widths and then declare something. And this looks like a custom property, but it doesn't matter because this whole thing is going to be removed during pre-processing. So we're just going to declare what these units are. Now, as we pre-process the style sheet, if we start at the top, we process the whole thing, and we read all these custom units, and then we remember what each one is declared as, then as we parse the rest of the style sheet and work with it, whenever we run across a dimension token that has a unit that matches one of the properties that we've read in our custom units already, then we can output something like here, we can rewrite this into valid CSS that completely removes the custom unit. So we could say, in the meantime, until we can do something like this in the browser, we want that to be 10 times 50 px, because that's what we set that to. So we don't necessarily want to be writing all these calcs. We don't necessarily even want to use custom properties in the final CSS output. But this is a way that we can specify custom units. This is 100% valid CSS. There's nothing wrong with it. This is also valid CSS. And look at what we can do with it. This is a script I wrote for Deno, which is a JavaScript runtime on the command line. And so I'm going to import that parse CSS module. Now I'm using mine because it allows me to restringify things. Tabs only parses. So there is improvement or work or other tooling that can be built around this that's very beneficial. Um, I've just got what I've been able to build so far. So I'm going to bring in the ability to parse a style sheet, to parse a list of declarations, to parse a component value individually, and to parse a list of component values. If you don't give a file name, nothing happens. But if you supply a file name at the time you run this, it will load the file, it will start a new units object to remember. The first step it does is it goes through your supplied CSS style sheet, and it looks for any of the at rules with the name of custom units. And then it parses the tokens inside as a list of declarations, because this doesn't have rules inside. These are declarations. So now, for each declaration, and I could have filtered this, but for each one, uh, I'm just going to save each property name to this with its declared value. So at this point, uh, that units thing would basically be the same as this uh, with these as strings. So like a string of 50 px. If there's more than one of these custom units at rules, uh, with redeclaring the same unit, it will just use the second, the later value. So by the time you hit this point in the code down here, um, you've already extracted all of the custom units in that style sheet. Now you're just going to take that whole style sheet and parse it token by token. And inside of the token, we're going to, if we find a dimension token, we'll replace it with that calc thing that I talked about. So we'll take the dimension token with the custom unit, we'll take its value, and we'll take the value from our custom units object that was declared for the unit that that token has, and we'll replace the token with the parsed component values of this string of calc whatever. Then, once we've done all that transformation, we log all of the rules that weren't custom units at rules to the console. So the result of this is if we say deno custom units, I think this is two, uh, we supply a file. We get back CSS similar to our original style sheet, but we've got 10 finger widths being replaced with uh, 10 times 
what we declared. So here is an example of something that if you wanted to do this, it's 70 lines of code. It's not that complicated. And you could have your own custom CSS units being pre-processed away into CSS that would work in some pretty old browsers, anything that supports calc. There's not even custom properties being used here. And I also made this recursive so that if a token has a value that has more tokens inside, you process those as well. And so you'll notice this one here is inside of a property uh, declaration that's inside of a rule, that's inside of an at rule, that's inside of another at rule. And in the output, it reached that finger widths inside and was able to do that as well. So there's one example of how you can just write 100% valid CSS to kind of create the workflow or support what it is you want to write and how you can transform it. But it's important that you parse it as actual valid CSS in order to be able to reason with it. Now I have another example here. This is kind of like a feature demo for a preprocessor that we use at work. Each of these rules is meant to just show off kind of one feature. So we've got um, the variation at rule, we have an important at rule, we have our own implementation of a document at rule, we have element queries, we have custom combinators like a parent combinator, previous elements, elder siblings, uh, closest ancestor that matches something, um, and just a bunch of stuff. So one of the problems is if we wanted to write CSS like this, I'm just going to take these first two rules and I'm going to copy them in to the other tools. So here in CSS tree, we have one at rule named reset and it doesn't have any declarations or rules inside. It just has some information here, a prelude. This is similar to the import at rule in CSS, which just has a URL and possibly some other stuff. Um, but it ends at this semicolon. So that's one complete rule. And we also have a second rule, just a regular style rule with a selector list with two selectors uh, below it. So these are two separate rules. Now here in CSS tree, it has not parsed the at rule correctly. And so it actually thinks that this is one style rule, the whole thing, and all of this code it thinks is the selector. So if you're working with that, chances are you're probably going to output the wrong code in your output, or you're not going to be able to correctly reason about or work with these things because it's conflating two separate rules and it doesn't even know what is a selector versus what is not a selector or what is an at rule versus what's not even an at rule. It only saw one style rule so far in this whole style sheet. I'll pull this into post CSS. I believe it does a slightly better job here. Yeah, we've got a reset at rule with the correct prelude here. And so that one worked, but there's other examples in this that just don't work that well. And the reason is because not only is it not parsing CSS according to the correct tokens and productions and everything else, but something that the existing tools that I've seen don't do well is error handling. This is also something that's specified in the CSS syntax spec for what to do in a reliable way when you find things that don't match something. So here's an example. If I had a, a with the brackets in between, CSS tree is trying so hard to keep everything and retain everything for my benefit that it doesn't drop the second a that it's supposed to, or I'll make that b. So here we've got what matches the production for a qualified rule. There's a selector and a block. And there's no declarations inside, but that's valid. Then there's a valid white space token, and there's a valid ident with a value of B. Now CSS can parse this, but because white space B is not a production, this doesn't or shouldn't make it into the resulting parsed CSS. So if I pull this into the browser, we can see that the browser will drop it because it knows it doesn't support just the letter B. If I parse this as CSS, again, we've got that first rule with the selector of A, and that's it. There's nothing after that. 
in post CSS, I believe it's the same as CSS tree where we've got just extra stuff hanging around in the AST because it's not actually handling CSS as CSS when it's invalid, which is the other half of parsing CSS. Now I can imagine why for post CSS, they want to parse invalid syntax so that they can work with it and turn it into CSS. It's not strict about only accepting valid CSS. And so I can understand why it's forgiving or why it tries to hang on to things. And I'm guessing the same here with CSS tree. They're probably thinking to make this easier for people working with it. We'll try to have it be very forgiving in what it parses. We'll try it. We'll try to make it work even if it, there's an error and then we'll hang on to whatever we couldn't do anything with and still give that to you. But there comes a point when you're working with a language and you're trying to build tools on top of it. Like maybe you're trying to build a linter and you need to know what is a selector and what's not a selector. And so when you don't have accurate tools, you're able to get so far and you're able to kind of fudge the fact that you're not doing it accurately for a while. But when you need to reach a certain level of precision or when you're trying to go beyond the existing tools, sometimes you hit a point where you need a tool with a greater level of accuracy and precision to be able to actually make progress and um, you know go to the net take it to the next level of technique or the next level of ability or um, the ability to reason about what you're working with you have a much more specific control over every single aspect of the language and the pieces in it now contrary to popular belief the CSS syntax module does not refer to only the CSS features and things that are su supported already. Um, so if you're trying to support future CSS syntax or custom CSS syntax or existing CSS that is not supported somewhere, um, parsing it as CSS is the first step on the path to being able to reason about that and do that. So I would love to see more CSS tools be uh, parsing CSS accurately, and hopefully people can converge on expressing CSS in valid CSS syntax, even when they're going to pre-process and even when they're going to use a plugin or a client side runtime to help them with the styling, or even when they're tying it into their components or their JavaScript framework, there's no reason why everything that needs to be expressed can't be expressed according to CSS syntax. And once we start doing that and building tools that do that, I think we'll see a huge synergy. And instead of being split off into these different silos of SAS syntax and all of its tooling and ecosystem and workflows and everything else and less and its syntax and everything, if we can all converge on standard CSS and parsing standard CSS as CSS, I think that's what really propels us. And the more people we can get on standard CSS, the faster CSS moves forward. So there's a real need or a drive for converging on standard CSS, bringing the innovation and the ideas from CSS and JS and expressing them in CSS syntax, taking the tooling and the workflows that we use outside of CSS and allowing people to configure or control it from inside CSS so that you can have a 100% CSS, 100% valid workflow that works with all tools and is interoperable with all the other tools people are building. So where can this go? Here's one last idea I'll leave you with, which I believe in order to do this accurately, we need the kind of tooling that can parse CSS correctly. So imagine in the future, you wanted to create a custom at rule. I'm going to call one demo. And inside that, you only want to allow certain things. Let's say you only want to have a custom pseudo class selector. And inside your rule with a custom pseudo class selector, the only properties that are valid are um, direction, which would be better if it was dash dash, so it's custom and 100% your own and um, depth. So who knows what you're gonna be doing with these. One question that I have is, already I'm skeptical that linters or things built on the existing tools we have have the ability to even lint 
syntax highlight or parse or reason about just normal CSS, but how on earth are our editors going to be able to reason about or inform us or validate or lint things like custom CSS constructs that we've defined for ourselves? So if we have a syntax like this, I'm wondering if in CSS we need something like what a doc type is in SGML or HTML or a schema in XML or JSON. Uh, I wonder about the, the ability to create a custom grammar. And inside that custom grammar, uh, we can say this is defining an, an, an at rule named demo. And we could put other stuff here too, but let's say for any demo at rule, it's going to have to abide by this grammar that we're defining. So maybe we can say selectors include uh, custom. And then perhaps inside this custom grammar, we can define the grammar for the selector uh, custom that I just used. And inside that, perhaps we can say uh, the properties allowed are direction and depth. And now let's say I say a custom grammar for the property. This doesn't even have to be in here. It could be uh, perhaps style sheet wide. I'll just put it in here. Uh, we'll keep nesting. Uh, let's say for direction or depth. Let's do these separately. So let's say the value has to be um, one of four idents. So let's say it's north, east, south, or west. Um, or what if we had you know, some kind of annotation for the type. So perhaps these are the only valid idents. Perhaps for a value, it just has to be a dimension token um, or perhaps an optional more than one. I don't know why you'd have more than one for depth, but you can see what I'm trying to say. I think that perhaps um, for the future of tooling and being able to validate our code and say like, uh, if you did something, then you get a little red squiggle under here because it says, aha, inside the demo at rule, you've used a selector that isn't part of the list here uh, and you get some kind of an error or something. Now, I'm not sure if there's anything like this. I know there's CSS linters, um, not really convinced how accurate they are but I am not aware of any way that people, CSS authors who are writing custom CSS can specify or create a grammar that is able to be validated or verified automatically or that any tooling at all, editors or workflow or anything is aware of. But that's the kind of thing that it doesn't seem like if you could parse this and you know what these things are, uh, why couldn't you include something like that right in your style sheet or you say, you know, at import custom grammars.css, and now your editor knows um, the custom grammars come from that file, um, perhaps project wide or something. So, just ideas like this, and kind of what I'm looking at, and what I think we need to get there, uh, I think really relies on us doubling down on 100% standard valid CSS. And I think the quicker we do that, the quicker we get you know, some of this insight or some of this ability. And I think CSS is really maturing. And so I think that one of the things that goes hand in hand with that is reasoning about it at a deeper level. Um, and thanks to Tab for creating and releasing this parse CSS, which to date is the first and only thing to actually seemingly parse CSS accurately. Um, without that, there's no way my fork, which just annotates it and cleans it up, I wouldn't be able to do or show this demo or um, be supporting or building the things that I'm building now. 
but I think that this is only the beginning and I can't understand why more people aren't crazy about supporting this and building on top of it and uh, working this way. Um, this is just kind of like what I've been able to do in the last few months, um, exploring some pre-processing stuff. But I know that there's people out there that can do some pretty amazing things with ASTs and can do some pretty amazing things, especially people that are working with some of these ASTs where there's more work to do on the actual parsed things. Um, this should be, the productivity should go way up when the thing that you're working with is a little bit richer and a little bit more contextually aware of the bits and pieces inside. Um, so here you can see a token followed by a function with the name of custom. And so that's how you can match pattern match that in your selector list. Um, yeah. So thanks for watching the video and I hope this makes sense. And this is not to say anything negative about existing CSS tools. Uh, I just think that we're kind of at a crossroads where to take the step that we need to take, uh, I think we need a stronger foundation and I think we need to really uh, tighten the bolts and uh, really shape up the CSS tooling so that we have the ability to reason about what we need to. So I hope you're having a great day and I hope this inspires you. If you have any ideas about the custom grammar or anything like this, check out the CSS package manager repository and uh, come brainstorm some ideas about what CSS could look like in a few years and how we get from where we are today to that future that we can envision. So thanks and have a good one.